Yep, the counter clock's slowed right down. So look, we might kick off. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's MPA seminar with David Gallen. Um, just need to start by acknowledging that we're all variously meeting on Aboriginal country, never ceded, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. In my case, I'm down in the southern part of Sydney um, on Durrawal lands. Um, look, tonight we're going to get a presentation by David Gallen from our far south coast branch. Dave's a conservationist, a campaigner and advocate, a lifelong educator, um, a filmmaker and a photographer. Um, I've got to say I'm really excited by tonight's presentation because it's, um, I think, what Dave brings to MPA is someone who's got a genuine commitment for connecting people, um, not just by being out in the bush with them, but by actually by using education, information, imagery to weave that story about what's special of um, this shared heritage that we all enjoy so much. So um, just before I pass to Dave, this is a recorded webinar and there's the opportunity for everybody to ask questions. If I can get you to just hover your, your mouse over the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see that there's, you bring up a menu and there's a couple of different headings. One's called chat and the other one is question and answer. Um, if you want to make a comment, by all means, put it in the chat. But if you'd like to ask a question which we can um, address at the end of the presentation, if I could get you to just type it into question and answer, and I'll make sure that we um, address those with Dave at the end of the presentation. All right, look, I hope everybody enjoys this. I'm going to pass over with great pleasure to David Gallant. Over to you, Dave. Thanks, Gary. Um, and I'm speaking to you from Deer and Gardens land and um, I pay my respects to elders past and present, the custodians of the land, the original custodians. So um, I'm about to try sharing. And there you go. <laughs> it's not working. Resume share. So David's sharing, just need to start the slideshow. Right, so um, the beginning of my, my work in photography, my interest in photography was a as a teenager. And uh, here's a picture of my uncle um, who was a pioneer newspaper photographer and uh, photographic editor for the Newcastle Herald. And during the holidays, I used to go out on uh, rounds with his photographers and reporters. Um, I'd go up to Newcastle and uh, spend the holidays there. So, and we'd go out in the bush and photograph different, um, different things, try and find some lovely organic shapes and forms. Um, I was a keen bushwalker. I think it's the last time I was ever in shorts. I uh, had a bit more hair then. Um, so we had a great interest in using these big format cameras. So this is a, a Linhoff on a, on a homemade tripod. Uh, this is in the Butterwings, um, just uh, recording some landscapes. And then I modified some, um, still using sort of 5.4 and uh, an old Pentax SLR. So um, this is uh, an eight day traverse of the Western Arthurs in Tasmania. And uh, great memories of some really long trips in Tasmania, sometimes three weeks, three weeks at a time. Um, they all alternated between all oh, the perfect weather and cloudless skies or once was 22 days of continuous rain and floods. Um, and here's another view of the Western Arthurs, one of my favourite places. So in the early days, uh, I was also very interested as well as natural, the natural world, natural history is recording uh, the conflicts around the environment. So this is the end uranium marches in Sydney in the, the late 70s. You might see over the, the, the man in the suit on the right hand side is Tom Uren. He's a great campaigner and later he came down to the southeast forests to help campaign for them and also got to, uh, to meet him uh, with my work in East Timor. I'm a, I'm a volunteer and help develop uh, schools in East Timor and Tom being a former POW 
um, and Commando, we met up there. So when I met, went down the coast in the, uh, the late 80s or mid 80s, um, I landed right in the middle of the height of the, um, of the campaigns for the Southeast Forest. So here, there's a, this is on Edrum Road, the road leading into the chip, chip mill. And um, there's a barricade there of people. You might see a sign in the back, the Tanawanglo group, water, not wood chips. And uh, I was a member of the Tanawanglo Catchment Protection Association. Right down the front, there's a man holding the helmet and uh, facing the, towards the camera. And that's AJ Brown, who was a, a student activist and helped organize some of the student protesters. And he got arrested a couple of times. He's now Professor AJ Brown for Griffiths University, uh, an expert on, on governance policy and, and the law. So it didn't hurt his career that he ended up in Cooma, Cooma prison uh, a couple of times. This is, um, I like this photo because I think it's just one, of the, one that just captures wall-to-wall -wall people and the tension of people getting arrested and people didn't get arrested for the heck of it. And they didn't get arrested because they were violent. There were lots of workshops in peaceful protesting. Um, and here are a young mother and a child who are getting taken away by police and rescue and just the absolute chaos of news crews trying to sort of hold their their, um, what are their microphone cables <laughs> over the crowd anyway. So um, there was lots going on. It was also a time of great humour. Here you see a few uh, familiar senators, young Bob Brown and um, Karen Sawada from the Democrats. And what we did, um, koalas were a really important part of the story. And when we found koalas in the, in the Tanawanglo, we turned the campaign completely around because then we had, uh, we had the, the aid of, uh, of scientists who came on board and uh, this was a little bit of an event we had where we uh, we covered up um, this we covered up the this sign, and we added a, a, a an attachment to the Tanawanglo State Forest sign. So at the top it said formally Tanawanglo State Forest. We'll see that later in the video, and then Bob Brown unveiled the Tanawanglo Koala Nature Reserve, which was our name. So there was quite a lot of good stunts that we did. We're very peaceful and creative and uh, you know, captured people's attention. And the, the man in the centre there in the, in the Kubra hat um, is uh, Roland Breckwalt. Roland was a, he worked for Parks and he, he was a writer and a farmer. And uh, he was one of the main leaders and came up with some fantastic strategies. And this was to blockade the, the logging trucks with uh, horses and that captured uh, national attention and um, really turned the Southeast Forest campaign around, which eventually saw 135,000 hectares become Southeast Forest National Park. So part of my film understory was trying to give a background, um, not just the, the vision that was coming across the news at times, uh, but, but what happened with local, local people. I mean, for myself, uh, I played cricket, um, at a club level and a, at a rep level with the um, leaders of the chip mill, the managers of the chip mill and, and managers within State Forest. And we all got on, you know, and, and this, uh, all my negatives, my all black and white negatives was sort of sitting there in a pile. And as environmental leaders started dying off or moving away, um, and at Gene Greenland's funeral, I thought, oh, tomorrow I want to start putting this story together and telling what it was like from a local perspective. So here we see environmentalists on the left, including Roland Breckwell and loggers on the right, um, you know, engaging in conversation. And, you know, and in the movie understory, you actually hear a few jokes being told by, by the loggers. Um, so it was quite a, quite a positive affair. You notice that there are chainsaws in the back of the, the logging truck, the logging ute there. Now there's no one carries a chainsaw in the forest. There's, uh, there's, there are three workers in three big um, mechanical harvesters that can clear just hectares of forest in a day. Um, you know, no one sets foot on the ground virtually. 
So besides local people campaigning, we had some celebrities as well. This is Sting, Sting um, visiting the forest with uh, one of his comrades, a, a leader from the Amazon, addressing the people. And there was a really good, pro, uh, really good event where we harnessed uh, um, local uh, Yuan people, Aboriginal people, and uh, local activists. And he was sort of reaching an accord between Australia and the Amazon. So besides uh, the work I was doing um, with uh, documenting uh, and helping out campaigns, like uh, I was helping out with photographs of the newspaper, sometimes we'd have the Premier of New South Wales come down and, you know, with short notice, and they'd say, Dave, can you whip up a photograph tonight? So I had to sort of convert the, the bathroom or the laundry into a, into a dark room and whip out some, some photographs to present. Um, this photograph on the right hand side is just spotted gum, just you know, in, in the rain, getting some amazing lime green colours. The, the wife of one of our top campaigners was a, was an artist. She did a whole a whole um, series on spotted gum um, bark. Fantastic! There's just so many different types. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so that was a five four negative. That's a that's a scan of one on the left hand side. I always got a kick out of listening to people when this was on an exhibition in a, uh, in a gallery somewhere, just hearing people try and interpret it. And they, you know, most people go, oh, it's a strange sort of fern. But most people didn't realise it's sort of like a, a 15 mil view of um, the, the nape of a, of a king parrot. So it's just a, a macro shot. Um, but that was another one of those, probably one of my first photographs to really gain um, some attention and um, you know help um, just develop my interest and um, yeah explore photography a bit further. So this is this is a spotted gum forest here, which was in Tanger State Forest, just north of me. I settled down at Wollumba, then I, I moved to Tathra, and uh, we bought uh, fifty acres and um, set up a, a voluntary conservation agreement on our place. So this is over the Bega River, not far away. And uh, just, I think it's a good indication just of uh, one species, but individual differences within a species. And this features in understory. And someone wrote to me later and said, oh, that picture from understory, can I get a copy of it? Just because it's just amazed at how many um, different appearances in the, in the one species of tree. Um, I started working, these are all slides, um, scans of slides. So this, Sugar glider, I did quite a series on sugar gliders. And these things were being sold through the Australian Museum Photo Library at the time. This was a, um, when you live in the forest, you get to see all sorts of things day to day. And one day I'm walking down the driveway and I heard like a little grunt about two metres away from me. And this is a lacy monitor, this goanna. Um, it got a sugar glider in its jaws. So. I dashed about 20 metres down of the house, raced back up, took a, took a shot, and it was the last, was the last exposure on the, the uh, slide film. So that was it. I only got one, which wasn't a great one, but just a record. Um, this is a yellow belly glider. Just You can hear them scream and rattle. I'm sure, look, I'm not telling anyone here something that I don't know. I just assume most of you have had some experience in the bush. You're all keen bushwalkers. Um, but uh, to hear um, to hear wildlife at night when you're when you're sitting down reading or watching television and uh, hear the rattle and uh, the throat and the screams of a, a yellow belly glider and you sort of dash outside. Um, so our our property burnt. Uh, we didn't lose our house; it was damaged. But we lost our garage and car in the 2018 Tarthra fire. And uh, it's only. As I was preparing this last night, I could hear yellow belly gliders sort of heading over the house again. I think they're feeding in silver top ash at the moment. But uh, they're a beautiful animal and um, really hard to photograph in that they're highly mobile. They'll, uh, they'll cover a lot of territory in the night by the time you sort of get set up and um, with a spotlight or something like that, they've, they've moved on. Um, and a lot of the things, some of the things you see tonight, I don't spotlight. I'll, I'll use the full moon to. Um, to illuminate the, the, the gliders or use an infrared. So when I'm using an infrared, I've got to move three tripods around 
um, one with a camera and one with uh, two infrared lights, sort of invisible beams that are really hard to set up. So they're much more useful for things like um, greater gliders, which don't move around a lot. So this is a greater glider down at Cascades in Mogbillagen National Park, just landed in the tree. Um, first time I ever, we, we went down there, we, we filmed platypus during the day and um, we expected to see gliders at night. And one landed, we were drinking soup just on dusk and one landed in the tree um, right next to me, right next to the car window. It was a great thrill. So I've been down there several times at night um, and trying to think of how you show, if I go back to that, it's very easy to show against, against the light background, but to show it at night, um, often I go down under full moon when the conditions are right to try and show the outline. Uh, because the greater gliders, as most of you know, would come in dark and pale face, the ones around there are fairly dark. So um, that took a little bit of, of work. Here's a, a light phase one. So this is, um, this is current, this is uh, about 10 days ago. Um, I'm helping out um, some PhD students who are doing glider studies and qual studies up the back of Batons Bay um, in the mountains there. And uh, this is where we, we, we caught um, six greater gliders the other night. And uh, these PhD students are doing um, measurement work, DNA work, they're taking samples and measurements. And it really brings home to me, um, you know, a lot of people dismiss academic work and, you know, just think common sense overrides that or their, their uh, prejudices over, over, overrides really hard academic data. But I mean, people like Professor David Lindemeyer, they've got data sets going back 30 years just working with these PhD students, you know, one or two nights a month, you know, they're out there following gliders, you know, from seven o'clock to three o'clock in the morning, seeing where the gliders end up in the, in the hollows and then sort of revisiting that, trying capturing them or photographing them the next night. Some nights you get none, some nights you get one. So, you know, it takes a long time to get the, I think they're up to 91 glider measurements at the moment, a long time to, um, to get that information. Some subjects are really good. So um, I was coming home from Mimosa Rocks National Park filming yellow belly gliders um, one night. And just as I'm coming down to the bridge in the Burger River, I passed this light shape in the, in, on an overhanging branch and turned around because I thought oh, it might have been an owl. It was a barn owl I hadn't photographed on before. So like most things, sort of photograph it from about 25 metres away, and then 20 metres away, and then 15, just to get a record, expecting it's going to fly off. And this one, I could have nearly touched that branch that he was sitting on and actually walked under the branch. And this is the last uh, photo I took, just uh, looking from underneath. So, yeah, some, some subjects in wildlife photography are just fantastic. It's just chance. And it, it is a challenging pastime or endeavour. Um, because there's always a branch sticking in the way and there was some difficulty. Uh, this is a sooty owl. Um, this is my first digital SLR, so it wasn't very good quality, but this is uh, a sooty owl um, calling at the back door. So just that's the advantages of living in the forest. Sometimes I'll hang around for um, several weeks. Um, sometimes you'll just find them when you're getting down into a, into a gully. So as I said, uh, we've got a voluntary conservation agreement um, to look after the land. Um, we've got some endangered species on there. Um, this, this is what happened to my nice new uh, replacement hide. This is mainly for photographing and some of the things you'll see later of um, animals visiting a water hole is uh, taken from um, either motion cameras in this beautiful water hole on our property or, um, or through the hide. Uh, it's very hard to get close to finches and, a, and a, a motion camera doesn't really pick up little things like finches when they're bathing um, because they're just so small and you can't direct the camera or get a sharp focus on them. So the only way to do it is from a hide. Um, talk about a bigger hide later too. So this is from a motion sensor. This one was featured in Nature Photographer of the Year with the Australian Geographic magazine. Um, we've got lots of live birds here and I've sold 
fair bit of footage um that sold something to um australian museum i took in a some footage not just of um not just of courtship dances on the lyrebird mound but actually mating on the on the mound for several years i was recording them dancing on the mound and um i thought they must go somewhere else to mate uh one season i caught two two uh clips of them mating on the mound and I took it to the Australian Museum. They said, oh, no one's ever recorded that before. So that was up until five or six years ago. Maybe they've done it now. But in between, I help out with um, uh, people monitoring little terns. So these are uh, migratory birds that sort of come from you know, several thousand kilometres away and they breed on the, the Beagle River and other places along the, the far south coast. So national parks help that foreshore program, which is really valuable. And so, yeah, from time to time, we get some either roadkill or something um, dies flying into our window. Um, this is a little part of light the other day. So out came the camera. And so it got new techniques like photo stacking, which didn't exist years ago with slide film and things like that. So that's um, it's a whole new area for me to learn. I'm always learning. We've got so many really good photographers on the, on the far south coast and south coast. The, really inspire me. A lot of young people just doing fantastic things uh, with cameras. And it's good that some of them made films and they've invited me to help them out. So this is uh, Gardenia Rainforest and this is uh, down the far south coast, the back of Pambula. And this didn't burn in the in the fires. And it's just one of the really beautiful areas and it's part of Southeast Forest National Park. And I just love those cloudy days I can get up on a ridge and look down in the forest. Um, uh, some people not really fond that I don't always capture the canopy, but I just I, I really I don't like unless the cloud or the, or the cloudscape or the, or the sky is really good. It's very hard to get a shot. It captures the canopy and the understory really well. But I just love those cloudy days. Often, if I see a forecast with a cloudy day, I sort of you know I'll head out in the forest. And the vertical of that became a, um, a poster for Understory, which was my first feature film. I've made lots of films with schools and for um, for the Timor group over the years, but it was my first film that uh, played from Sydney sort of down the coast and out to Canberra, the um, National Sound and uh, Film Archive. So this is a little bit of a trail which gives you a taste for it, those of you who haven't seen it. In the 1980s, we realised that the woodchip mill was expanding and that the operations were going to spread up into the northern part of the southeast forest. And the most remarkable thing happened. Um, locals got together at a small way first, but within a few years, we had a group called the Tanawangra Catchment Protection Association, which attempted to save the Tantawango from logging. And so we were looking down the barrel at large scale logging in Tantawango. So the community got together and fought it. And it culminated in 1989 when we had the first logging of the catchment um, down a place called Robinson's Road. We had road blockades, we had horse actions. We had people with their cars blocking Robinson's Road. Uh, we had people up poles in the middle of the road. We had people arrested. We had 200 police down from Sydney at the tactical response group. We had people holed up in a hut on Bob and June's Wilkinson's property on the road. We went in every night with supplies across the swamp using a compass bearing. We set up tripods in the middle of the night. Um, but it was just a remarkable effort that local people got together and fought for something they really felt for. And as I get older, I realise that governments are not going to achieve any reasonable outcomes 
in the protection of the, of the natural, natural environment. It's got to be the local people who stand up for the areas they care for. And when I look back on the 15 year campaign for the Southeast Forest, the thing to me that was remarkable is that we achieved the National Park. So that was the, uh, the voice of Kim Tayson. Some of you know Kim through National Parks Association. And Peter Constable was really generous. All that old uh, footage that he would have um, sent to you know, Prime TV and ABC and Channel 10 back in the 80s, he, he just gave me access to all his archives. Didn't ask me to cut it certain ways. He was just very generous. I appreciate that. We'll be using it, some of it too, when we... Um, developing a sequel to um, Understory 2, which will address the climate change issue and carbon issues um, in the future of forests. Uh, and June and Bob Wilkinson um, were in that and they were talked about and you saw them in there. Um, Bob was in the snow there in the southeast forest. And he recently died. And, uh, but they were graziers and they, they borrowed money. They were graziers for several generations. Their families borrowed money to buy um, land that was going to be wood chipped and that's part of the Southeast Forest National Park today and um, the in their pack of swamp. So, um, and June was on Landline the other day on ABC to, um, with, in terms of the Brumby campaign, she held up a, a, a coffee pot, um, you know, sorry, and, and the photo with a coffee pot in it and um, with her grandparents and um, Benjo Patterson um, was in, <laughs> Was in the photo as well, sort of trying to counter some of this um, pro pro uh, feral horses uh, lines. So that's one of the things that we. That's one of the things that we uh, try and um, convey when we talk to people about forests. Um, you know, how do you value a forest? And it's the forest that we all own, at public forests, and um, we heard just this last week. Um, for the 2020-2021 financial year that uh, Forestry Corporation lost $6 million again. So that's, that's not accounting for any of the work they did with um, following up from the fires. So they're just losing several million dollars a year. It's costing taxpayers to cut down our forests and degrade our forests. It's just, uh, it's just ex extraordinary. This is back up in uh, sort of contemporary work. This is back up uh, the Clyde River, Clyde Mountain, um, where I've been doing that work with gliders and quolls. And uh, that, that area burnt, but I was on, um, yeah, I looked at it for some time. This, this photo, of, uh, it's called Home of the Quoll, um, which really was really helpful for my photographic career. So, um, this was accepted in, uh, to the exhibition Wildlife Photographer of the Year in 2018. So this image went round the world. Um, it was, I choose 100 out of uh, 55,000 entries. And um, I'm really pleased with it because as soon as I saw that log, and I, I had been filming with motion cameras uh, qual clips for understory, in fact, for understory, I wanted to show quolls and, and lyre bird footage, things that people normally don't see in the forests. Um, far easier to see a quoll, a spotted tail quoll in Tasmania, but it's quite another thing that's hard to see in the south coast. And uh, so only a couple of months before the premiere, I still had no quoll from the southeast forest. So um, getting this these shots and clips were really important. When I'm talking to people um, you know, in various groups and seminars and things, or you show, you show someone a picture of a spotted tail quail, you know, three out of five people will sort of say, what is it? Is it like a cat? Um, so seeing something that's uncommon, and we, we know that National Parks recently tried to rewild um, Eastern quails back from Tasmania. 
the last of the Eastern Quolls died out in, um, in Vaucluse of all places uh, in 1962. So yeah, this image has been published a few times by the Natural History Museum in London. But even that area, I mean, I'm in the RFS, I've been in the RFS for nearly 20 years now. And um, I was in strike teams during the Black Summer fires down along the Clyde River, the back of Batemans Bay. And I slowly watched the fire maps uh, week after week, just hoping that, that that wet area, which is just so, so moist, it's like Misty Mountain Roads, one of the road names, uh, doesn't always rain, but it's just wet, just even from the mountain mist from the sort of the, the, the weather, the clouds sort of heading up, up the escarpment from the coast. And, uh, you know, one of these trips, I had seven leeches uh, on me as, I, as I'd left, um, uh, as I left the park. So, you know, eventually that, that did succumb uh, to the fire, which really demonstrates that picture was taken um, to early 2016 during that intervening period that that park just got drier and drier, which I think is a real indicator of the effects of climate change. So these are just pictures where I raced up, as soon as the road opened, I raced up to um, photograph Monga National Park after those fires. It'll take a long time before it's looking like that again. I mean, the tree ferns, as you know, have come back very strongly after the fire, but um, certainly the vegetation on the ground, and, um, the gliders are still there, the quolls are still there, still flying lots of those, but just finding the right balance and the vegetation will take a long time. But as soon as I saw that sort of on the S bend, um, I, I knew I, I had the basis of a good photo and uh, the, the, the section that, that, um, that was entered in was um, animals in their environment, because I think the, the the tree ferns in the background are just as important as the uh, the coal. When I was firefighting, one of the uh, the main in their briefings, the main um, things they indicate, of course, are falling trees. They're the biggest danger um, you face. And also, when we're working along the Clyde, there the back of Nellage and was uh, death adders. Saw so quite a few death adders, and this is one just uh, under uh, under a bridge. <laughs> Um, so a lot of the uh, areas around uh, the south, far south coast burnt and uh, we were very worried. Um, I took this at about four o'clock in the morning. I thought that we had fires to the north, the east and the south. The border fire had come through, the Badger fire had burned in from the west and um, we had fires just near Bermagui. And, uh, um this bridge is actually in a campaign that people are trying to save this bridge. Um, and uh, the fire you can see in the background, is just a koala territory. We've got about 50 or 60 koalas there um, in that forest in the Murrah Flora Reserve. And uh, we're very worried about how they, how they would survive. I've got to say that the National Parks Association and the local Bermagui Brigade and Tanger Brigade did a fantastic job with also some Queenslanders to help save that forest. I was doing night shifts sometimes and, um, you know, in quiet times when we're doing uh, backburns like this, so I'd um, take some photos. So yeah, I've been doing some panoramics during, it's very hard to capture that, that eerie light. Um, it looked like nighttime uh, when we went to fires all around us. So the top one's a panoramic just around my house of all the trees and that eerie light. And the bottom one's the border fire from um, far down south. Okay, moving along. So this is a little short film called The Ambassador with Wynne Roberts. And Wynne died a couple of um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and he had uh, he was a veteran actor from uh, Picnic and Hanging Rock. And he lives in the forest up, um, up the back of Tangier. So I was very lucky to have when he'd appeared in um, various films that I made with our school students. And you'll hear him refer to um, his teacher and his granddaughter. So I was the teacher and um, let the film speak for itself.
Attention, Environment Minister, the Honorable Susan Lay. Dear Minister, I've had the pleasure of living for over 50 years in the forest, and I've been concerned for many years about how we treat forests. In the 1980s, I narrated a film that described how our public forests were heavily logged, turned into wood chips for export. Well, not much has changed over the last 30 years. We're still exploiting our forests so that a few make profit at the cost of our natural assets. Forests are a natural solution for the impact of a changing climate. During the recent federal election, there was much debate about the perceived high cost of climate policies. And the Lancet and other respected journals clearly show that protection of native forests is the cheapest form of climate mitigation. By stopping the logging of what's left of our native forests, We'd be doing more to protect endangered species. There are currently a thousand endangered species in New South Wales alone. The last known wild Tasmanian tiger was killed when I was six years old. Its extinctions widely felt. Since then, there have been many expeditions to find one in the wild, including one by my granddaughter, who borrowed a motion camera from her former school teacher. She knew her chances of finding one were virtually zero, but she was just as interested in finding what animals were still living in the wilds of Tasmania. Minister, I'm 95 years old. I've seen many changes in my lifetime. There are real concerns now for the future of other distinctive species, such as the koala, the greater glider. It's beyond belief that these once plentiful species could go the way of the thylacine. We have a duty to future generations to protect our unique wildlife. To remind you of this, I'm including a thylacine stamp. It's your responsibility to ensure that we'll have more than just images of our wildlife in future years. To that end, I'm writing on behalf of the forests because we need them intact. Never more than now. So yeah, that film um, won the prize, the Environment Prize, in the Far South Festival a couple of years ago. It was supposed to be a a chapter in a longer film, but uh, people weren't that wrapped in the idea, so we just made a little one film out of the five minute section. This next one is a, an ad uh, that we put in cinemas during a couple of summers. If I can get it to play. That no, will skip it. Sorry. Um, the koalas, as I said, have been a big part of the uh, protection, the conservation movement. That's a little infrared shot of a koala. Yeah. Uh, this is the hands of a friend. Uh, we went out. We we're a group of six people, uh, national park rangers um, and uh, conservationists who went out, uh, RFS people really, um, looking for koala scats after the fires. And uh, Mark, he's got uh, koala scats, fresh koala scats that were found on burnt ground, which showed that the Murrah koalas were alive. And I took this one last week um, when Sand phoned me actually to leave early to go out and photograph this. Um, this koala, and this was on Mark's property. So he's been finding koala scats for decades on his place. And this is the first time in 30 years that he's seen a koala on his property. So they're really hard to see and quite scattered. And these two koalas, uh, this Joey, it's about 18 months old. Um, and the mother, the mother has got damaged eye and her the soles of her hind feet are um, burnt. 
but she carried that joey five or six kilometers out of the fire zone um in uh on the murrah fires just south of bermagui and uh, she stayed in this tree for 12 days in private land and uh, moved tree for one night and then headed back into the reserve so yeah it's still fairly resilient but wildfires are really hard on koalas so still um, people sort of think, you know, wood shipping stopped. It's the wood chip mill's been going 50 years and still going strong. Some of the con conservationists, we went down and served an eviction notice. <laughs> you know, it was a mock eviction notice on, I think, last year or the year before on the, uh, on the mill. And protests are still going on. So, you know, you notice the poster before said Australia's biggest um, environmental campaign um, conflict. So it's been going on since the 70s. And here, um, the Extinction Rebellion folk are blockading the chip mill. This is a couple of weeks ago. So it's still, still going on because it's just, uh, as you know, the Natural Resources Commission had a leaked report the other day just showing there was a recommendation that logging should have stopped in February this year. And now we're in December and it's still going full ball with the logging. So this is during COVID. This is uh, down my backyard again. I heard uh, unfamiliar bird sounds and galahs were nesting in this little hollow. And I just thought this, will, this uh, imagery will be part of a future campaign because hollows are really where the action is at post the mega fires for animals to find um, a home. We're just about winding up now. So um, yeah, rhinos don't need a hollow, but I'm sort of getting back to the roots of my photography. I collected wheat bix cards when I was a kid. And those wheat bix cards in the 1960s said that uh, there's 50 white rhinos or wide mouth rhinos <coughs> alive when I was a child. That's one of the great conservation success stories that they've um, that they've survived. And uh, there were tens of, you know, it's over 10,000 in the 1980s, but unfortunately, with organised crime syndicates, they've, um, they've been poached heavily again. I just want to put a slide or two, this is a slide scan of Namibia, uh, just to sort of round off this story, because like Bradman, when he saw the SCG for the first time, said he'd never be happy until he saw, uh, until he played on the SCG, the Sydney Creek Ground. I thought I'd never be really happy as a photographer until I photographed rhinos in the wild. And as I was coming home from the last trip, I passed a sign on the highway going back to the capital saying from the government, please report poaching. Rhinos and elephants are the pillars of our economy. When I downloaded um, the information, um, you know, letters and things when I got back, got web, web access the first story i found um, was uh, professor david watson resigning from the new south wales threatened species committee uh, over the protection of wild horses in kosciuszko national park and he said at the time to see the minister responsible endorse the bill for crying out loud are you even trying to pretend that you consider the advice we give you So, oops. So when I see things like that, um, you know, it's just outrageous uh, what what those people have done. Um, on the one hand, you see a developing country knowing what the true worth what the true worth of their uh, wildlife is, and then we. Um, We've got critically endangered species there in Kosciuszko and we're prepared to put them at risk. It just doesn't make, uh, doesn't make sense ecologically. Hand you back to you now, Gary, for questions and answers. We nearly got to the end. Thanks, David. Um, wow. Uh, I've got to say this was such a testimony to the power of filmmaking. It's um, on one hand, you know, we, I'm sure I wasn't the only one who got a very emotional reaction to the beauty of the imagery. Uh, 
but at the same time as this chill that went down my spine as Kim Tyson was talking about the fact that you can't rely on governments to act. It actually takes local action. And I think to what's happened on the international stage over the last month or so in terms of our government showing their inability to act, which was, um, yeah, it's a little bit sobering. Um, look, I'm in the really fortunate situation of, as the MC, I get to kick things off by asking the first couple of questions, David. Um, and I would encourage others to put your questions down on the question and answer. Um, in terms of the, the imagery that you showed us, where, you, you know, there was, it seemed as though there was a bit of a chronological um, progression from landscapes um, through to sort of intimate landscape, you know, people and events and wildlife. And I'm just wondering if you might comment to us about whether you, you keep all of those pots boiling or whether you actually see where you've landed in um, wildlife imagery as having a sort of a power that goes beyond, if you like, the earlier generations of Australian nature photographers who, you know, as much as anything else, I guess, by the nature of the technology they had, um, were pretty cemented to the landscapes and intimate landscape sort of um, genres. Oh, well, preparing for the webinar, I found a lot of rubbish. <laughs> it, was, it was like back in the slide days, very hard because uh, quality of slide film, the best slide films like Kodachrome is so slow, uh, unless you use flash. And, um, and sometimes I had a license from Parks where I could capture things like shoe gliders and then photograph it in the studio. So some of the better quality stuff was, was actually done in the studio. Um, and that's why it took me, I delayed a long time to make understory because it was only with the advent of getting access to a drone um, cameras and uh, half decent sort of um, not quite high, well, it's called high definition, but they're pretty low quality um, motion cameras that we recorded the things that we wanted to record, that we dreamt of recording. So I mean, back when I started off, we were thinking about kites. You can go and look at the old textbooks and people put cameras in kites to try and get that aerial view. And I certainly took a few um, pictures out of planes and helicopters. Uh, that shot of the clearing was Richard Green. I was in his helicopter before he died in the helicopter crash. Um, uh, unless you can get access to, you know, to give that overview was, was quite hard. So um, now, of course, with digital photography, you can, you can snap away and you can learn from your mistakes on site in situ you know, and, um, and fine tune things, it's much easier. Yep. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about the much easier. Um, mm. One thing that's clearly not easy that just sort of snuck through in passing conversation was that um, your reference to the, you, when you're doing nocturnal work, you don't spotlight for animals. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm just wondering if you might sort of unpack that in, in, in two directions. Yeah. One, I guess, how you actually find the animals and set up your shots. And the other, of course, um, you're obviously spending time by yourself in the, in the bush. And um, is that something that you feel comfortable with over all this time? Or do you, you know, do you have particular procedures you use to make sure that you do feel sort of safe in that environment? Because it's certainly not a familiar sure. one for many you know, even sort yeah. of hardened bushwalkers, we don't tend to wander around in the bush by ourselves. Yep. So I think last time I did a nine day walk and I climbed Federation Peak when I was 40, um, and I met my wife, I said, um, and, uh, and I've had two search, I've, I've helped out with two search and rescues in Southwest Tasmania. Um, I just said, never doing that again. It was a great trip, flawless, but, um, without an EPIRB, you know, and so now I always carry an EPIRB with me. I always carry mm. GPS. I always GPS where my car is. But I don't worry about going in the forest at night. I love going in the forest at night. Um, the, the main thing is, I mean, I, you can hear animals. So using sound more than anything to locate animals. I never use callback because uh, I think that's the preserve of professionals because I think, you know, it's only a last resort. But I think it distresses animals. Too much. I mean, I do use torches um, at times to get a focus on the, on the animals. But if I um, if I can use my infrared beams, I get um, more natural um, 
behavior, feeding behavior and crawling through the, through the canopy. Uh, we just lost that last clip. We lost time, but it just cut out. Um, just one of a, uh, a greater glider crawling out of a tree, which is completely hammered by the fire. So it's just crawling out of a dead dead tree out of a hollow. Um, so we, we located that one during the day and then set it up and just let the cameras roll uh, and let it record during the night. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. And uh, there's a question here from Mike Thompson, uh, another MPA South Coast member who's asking, can we please open our second Eden Vision event with your understory sequel? I think that might, that might have to be a question direct to uh, Dave, Mike, rather than on this sort of open forum. Um, look, that brings us to the end of this evening. Um, I want to just reiterate my thanks to you, David, for um, your presentation tonight. It's a genuine joy to see the the artistry, the the effort, and the um, the absolute determin that's, determination that's gone into building that body of work. Um, I've got to say, as you know, someone who has had the occasional moment when a sooty owls decided to scream out with that screaming woman call unexpectedly at night, I'm still a little bit in awe of your sort of comfort being out there um, uh, in the dark all the time. But I sort of, you know, something we all, I guess, need to try it. Um, it's certainly an experience. Uh, lots and lots of thanks on the on the chat, which I'll just leave you to sort of run through, but. Um, I think the overwhelming sort of response has been one of, of wonder. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, just want to let everybody know that our next webinar is actually on the Monday rather than Wednesday. And it's a, a joint piece with the, um, the Australian Society of Bush Regenerators. I'd encourage you to go and look at the NPA Facebook account or uh, our website to get the details for that. And Sam will no doubt be sending them out with the Bushwalking Bulletin as well. Um, thanks so much to everybody for your participation tonight. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, what a great way to almost finish the year um, with a view of nature that is just not afforded to most of us and uh, extraordinarily special. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Gary. And I know some of, I know a lot of people have written letters. That's why I wanted to show when Robert's doing that tonight. I know a lot of people have uh, written submissions on the Wild Horses Act and Special Precinct and uh, Kosciuszko, all those things. So keep, keep writing. That's all I can say. Thanks, everybody. Bye.